Greetings from the county line. Sometime last month, you might remember, I suggested there's someone or something beyond the material universe that's responsible for our morals. While I'll admit to slipping a time or two and dropping God's name, I hope nobody thought I was trying to lead you into a religious discussion disguised as philosophy. I really wasn't. Let me explain. But first, one loyal listener was confused about the idea of getting ourselves lost on a car trip and turning around to start over. But wouldn't that be the only sensible thing to do? If we just keep driving in the hopes that somehow we'll eventually come up on some familiar town or landmark, we're never going to get where we want to be. Come to think of it, I've gotten lost a few times. It always seemed like an adventure. I may not have gotten where I wanted to go, but that sometimes seems like the best way to find some place you've never been. It seems like every time I got off course, though, I, I wish that I'd turned back a little sooner. But I digress. Let's move away from that metaphor and just think about this. Progress means moving closer to where you want to be. The most progressive person is the one who turns back first as soon as he realizes he's off course. The sooner we admit that we're wrong and start over, the faster we make progress. There's nothing progressive about being so stubborn that we refuse to admit we've made a mistake or, if you'll pardon the expression, taking a wrong turn. A few months ago, our former ambassador to the UN and disappointed presidential hopeful Nikki Haley said at least a couple times that the world's on fire. She's probably right about that. It's pretty obvious that humanity's made some fairly significant mistakes. We're on the wrong highway and as soon as we admit it we have to turn around and go back. Going back is the quickest way forward. Secondly, this discussion hasn't yet become a religious talk. Again, I admit to name-dropping God a couple times, but I wasn't referring to any God in particular. We've only arrived at the concept of a somebody or something behind moral law. For the moment, let's not rely on the church or the Bible. Let's instead explore this idea using our own intellectual efforts. What we learned through this process was kind of a surprise. The first is the universe itself, which, unless you think that matter can come out of thin air, must have been the creation of design by someone or something. If we look around, we have to admit the universe is beautiful and complex, but also merciless and at times terrifying. The second piece of evidence is the moral law itself, a sense of justice and compassion which seems to be a part of every human conscience. The difference between right and wrong. And this piece of evidence is even more important, more valuable, than examining our world through the universe as a whole, because understanding right from wrong is an internal experience. It belongs to us. It lives within us. From that experience, we could reasonably assume that whoever made our world is very concerned with moral conduct, truthfulness, loyalty, helpfulness, friendliness, courtesy, kindness, and so on. In that sense, we agree with Christianity and other religions that God is good. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's not assume that just because God programmed us to be nice to each other, He's always going to be nice back to us. The moral law is unforgiving. It tells us what to do, what is right, regardless of how painful, dangerous, or uncomfortable it may be. If God is like moral law, he's no sissy. Last month, in talking about right and wrong, I pointed out that none of us, at least nobody I socialize with on a regular basis, is truly abiding by this natural moral law. People all around the world my friends and I included, have this peculiar idea as to how we're supposed to behave, how we should treat each other. We can't seem to ignore it. But then, despite the seemingly instinctual urge to do the right thing by each other, we often do the exact opposite. These two facts form the foundation of all plain thinking about ourselves and our world. 
We generally know what we're supposed to do, but for some reason we do something else. If absolute goodness exists, it must hate a lot of the stuff we do. This puts us in a terrible pickle. I mean, what's the point? If the universe, our world, isn't governed by absolute goodness, then everything we do is ultimately hopeless. But, if it is, then we make ourselves enemies of that goodness all the time. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of chance that things are going to get any better anytime soon. We can't manage without absolute goodness, yet we don't seem to do very well with it either. Moral law, which came from God, is our only source of comfort and hope. But He's also the cause of our terror. He is both what we need the most and what we want to hide from. He's our only potential ally, yet we've turned our backs on Him. Now, my third point. The reason I took such a roundabout approach to get to my theme wasn't to try and fool you. My goal was, is, to emphasize that Christianity can't possibly make sense unless we come face to face with the facts. Christianity calls for regrets and promises mercy. Christianity has nothing to offer to anybody who never does anything wrong. Christianity only makes sense when we acknowledge the existence of a genuine moral law, recognize the power behind it, and understand that we've broken that law and frustrated that power. If you can agree to those three things, Christianity ought to make sense to you. If you'll admit that we know how to act, yet often do the opposite, and have become a big disappointment, then Christianity should seem relevant. And if you've come along this far, probably you also realize that our situation is desperate. Now, you probably also understand what the Christian faith is about. Christianity explains how we ended up seeking justice and goodness while at the same time hating the concept. Christianity describes how the demands of the moral law were met on our behalf because Neither you nor I seem to be able to abide by them. How God Himself became a man to save humanity from itself. It's an old story, and if you want to know more, I'd encourage you to consult with somebody who has more authority on the subject than I do. All I'm asking you to do is look at these terrifying facts and understand the questions relevant to all of us that Christianity claims to answer. The world's on fire. That's a pretty terrifying idea. And even if it's just political theater, I wish I could give you something more hopeful, but I gotta call it like I see it. Certainly the Christian religion provides some comfort in the long run, but it, but it don't come easy. First, we have to wade through all this apprehension I've been describing. It's impossible to find peace and comfort without experiencing alarm, sadness, and most likely depression. In fact, we wouldn't even know what those things were without the other. Many of us have outgrown the wishful thinking stage. We're past the delusion of optimism we shared before the towers were attacked, before the murder of innocence was turned into political fodder, before Sandy Hook. It's time we got real with religion, too. According to the most recent Pew Research, 85% of people living in the U.S. believe in God. Another 4% as atheists. The rest either don't want to talk about it or believe that there probably is a God, but they'd like to see some proof. We call this last group agnostic. Their view is that human reason can't provide sufficient rational grounds to justify the belief that God exists. This used to be my club. I needed proof because I was too smart to fall for the shtick. There's an idea that highly educated people are less religious, on average, than those with less education. Now, I find this a little hard to swallow because almost every priest I know holds an advanced degree and a few even hold doctorates. And now, a new analysis of Pew Research Center surveys shows that the relationship between religion and education in the United States isn't really that simple. On one hand, among U.S. adults overall, higher levels of education are linked with lower levels of religious commitment by some measures, such as belief in God, how often people pray, 
and how important they say religion is to them. On the other hand, Americans with college degrees report attending religious services more often than Americans with less education. The majority of American adults, 71% in fact, identify as Christians, and among Christians, those with higher levels of education appear to be just as religious as those with less schooling, on average. In fact, highly educated Christians are more likely than less educated Christians to say they are weekly churchgoers. But, when Pew looked at the U.S. as a whole, they learned that typically, the more educated Americans keep away from church. Highly educated Americans also are less inclined than others to say they believe in God with absolute certainty and to pray on a daily basis. And when asked about their religious identity, college graduates are more likely than others to describe themselves as atheists or agnostics. There's a ton of research as to why this is. The most prevalent seems to be that religion is instinctual and that the smarter and better educated among us are able to reason beyond their instincts. Another is that education often equates a higher standard of living, which can sometimes find God a bother. It may be hard to avoid the guardrails when you're traveling in the fast lane. One study appearing in 2013 article of Psychology Today suggests that religion is part of our evolutionary process. If we couldn't explain what we saw or what was happening around us, we invented some god to either give blame or credit. You may remember that the first century Jews blamed blindness and leprosy on something bad that you or your family had done. So, why do people believe in God? Some people, those who have never heard of the Garden of Eden, think that our evolutionary ancestors were all atheists. But somewhere along the way, they must have found religion. So we're back to our original question. If the Adam and Eve story is so hard to swallow, I mean, when one of the main characters was a talking snake, why do people believe in God? What happened that created religion? Well, David Ludden, a psychology professor at Georgia Gwinnett College, wrote in a 2018 paper that religious belief of some sort is a nearly universal feature of humanity. So there's probably some ultimate evolutionary cause that explains it. At the same time, not all people are religious. And besides, the forms of belief among the religious range widely. So we need to understand the causes for this variation. Fully modern humans arrived on the scene about a quarter million years ago, and until recently, they were all hunter-gatherers. In these primitive societies, the men hunted, fished, or scavenged for meat, while the woman gathered fruit, roots, and vegetables. They lived in small groups of around 100 to 150 people because this was the largest population that the surrounding terrain could support. Still, these groups are a lot larger than the societies of apes from which we may or may not have evolved, which tend to number in the few dozen range. Humans are far more capable of cooperation than other primates, enabled by certain evolved reasoning mechanisms. The most important among these is a sense of agency, the way everything in our world is connected. As tool users, humans quickly developed an understanding that they can intentionally cause things to happen. The nut cracked open because I smashed it with a rock. The apple fell because I shook the tree. Humans then apply this sense of agency to interpreting social connections. If I behave in a certain way, I may expect a certain reaction from the people around me. A good example is try smiling at people in a busy grocery. In fact, we're kind of hypersensitive about other people's actions, inferring intention where none existed. For example, when we smile at somebody in a grocery store aisle and get back nothing but a frown, we generally assume they did it on purpose, that they just don't like us, and they know fully well how rude and inconsiderate they're being. Rather than supposing, that they just had to put their dog down, or maybe didn't even see us in the frantic search for a gluten-free Pop-Tart. We're quick to assume that people act purposefully and discount the extent to which people's behaviors are shaped by their current circumstances and limitations. 
For the same reason, we all have a tendency to think the world revolves around us. We also have a tendency to line up with the Ghostbusters. Beliefs in woodland spirits, specters and spooks, ghosts and demons, flying saucers, Bigfoot and election fraud are all some of the superstitions you can find in every culture around the world. Because the natural world is complex and acts in mysterious ways. We detect organization in that, a connection all around us. By the way, if you think that you, as an intelligent, educated human being, living in this modern society, are free of such superstitious nonsense, you need to ask yourself, have you ever begged your car to start on a cold winter morning? Just the other day I was trying to loosen a rusted bolt and it, it didn't want to give. I've been soaking it with penetrating oil and even tried heating it up with a torch. Then, as I was pulling on a three-foot pipe I'd slid over a wrench for leverage, I said the four magic words out loud. Come on, you son of a bitch. And I felt the thing turn a little. I can't explain it. Maybe God took my desperate plea as a prayer and answered. But this kind of belief that supernatural forces inhabit the world and can influence events is a universal human trait. It's very common in kids who are more open-minded than we, wise adults. And as adults, our animistic thinking is shaped by the norms of our culture, where we once thought that divorce was actually good for kids. Some 15,000 years ago, humans gradually started farming. At first, our ancestors domesticated a few animals and tended gardens to supplement their hunting and gathering, but eventually, all but a few societies around the world shifted solely to farming and herding. Agriculture can feed a lot more people per acre compared with hunting and gathering, but this progress came with a cost, kind of like the internet has today. It broke people up, separated them from each other, their societies lost the agency, the cohesion to impart values on each other and to make sure that they were not only enforced, but passed along to the next generation. The divide grew worse during the industrial age. As times became more desperate and values, those once held to be true and were able to be reinforced with connected groups, began to erode. We called on God for guidance. Our ancestors also invented gods for anything that couldn't be explained. Lonely? Pray to Aphrodite. Need courage to ask a girl out? Pray to Aphrodite's husband, Ares. Plumbing problems? I guess that might be Poseidon. It was the ancient Jews who first began to recognize and worship one god, responsible for everything. Fast forward a dozen millennia, and here we are living in a technologically advanced society driven by science that tells us the world moves according to the laws of physics and not the whims of spirits and deities. But still, religious belief in one or more gods that are always looking on our shoulders and judge us accordingly is pretty common. Next month we're going to find out how, with all that going on, Christianity has been around for 2,000 years, and the Jews even longer than that. Have a great week. Next week, we're celebrating Mother's Day.